I'd like to call the March 21, 2023 meeting of the County Commission to order. Thank you all for being with us this evening. Let's begin our meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise and join us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I will read the ethics reminder to the board. In accordance with the code of ethics adopted by the board, all county commissioners have a duty to obey all applicable laws regarding official actions, to uphold the integrity and independence of the office, to avoid impropriety in the exercise of official duties, to faithfully perform the duties of the office, and to conduct the affairs of the governing board in an open and public manner. Are there any items on the agenda, the outcome of which would have a direct, substantial and readily identifiable financial impact for any board member. Does any board member have a financial interest in any public contract coming before the board today? There being none, all board members, <clears throat> excuse me, all board members have a duty and obligation to vote on any matters that the Board of Commissioners vote on at our meeting tonight. Um, want to make an announcement that any members of the public who are attending the meeting who parked in the county's parking facility next door or utilize public transportation to attend the meeting can get validation for your parking or transit passes from one of the security officers who's here this evening. You can see them on your way out. Commissioners, are there any questions about any items on the consent agenda? Are there any questions? Uh, uh, do any members of the public have any questions about any items on the consent agenda? Um, staff have asked that we pull from the consent agenda, I'm sorry, under new business, not the consent agenda. Under new business, the uh, budget amendment for additional grant funds for Woodfin Greenway um, there's some additional information that needs to be worked on, to, so we'll be ready for that. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda and the remainder of the agenda as published, except for the um, Woodfin Greenway item? So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, we uh, come to public comment, and we have uh, several folks who've signed up. Um, to speak, and uh, is there anyone, um, Mr. Joyner, that you're aware of in the overflow room? Okay. Okay, great, yep. Sure, no problem. All right, so uh, four folks have signed up. We'll go through the, that list. If anyone would else like to address the board after we go through the folks that have signed up, um, there'll be an opportunity uh, to take additional comments at that time. Uh, every person's got three minutes to address the board. You'll get an orange light when you've got about 30 seconds left, and then a red light when the three minutes is up. And we ask that you please discontinue your comments uh, when your time's up, because we want to give everyone the same amount of time to address the board. And um, if you just come to the mic and just tell us your name and where you live, um, thank you all for being here. The first person that signed up is Andrew Clark. Hello, I'm Andrew Clark, and I was here last month in support of McCormick Field and the funding, an American way of life. I'm here today as Legislative Director for Beddingfield Scheidel Chapter 14, Disabled American Veterans. DAV 14 
is dedicated to a single purpose, empowering veterans to lead high-quality lives with respect and dignity. I'm here today asking the county's urgent support for helping a unique program at the Charles George VA Medical Center, a program not federally funded, but thanks to amazing community partners from across this great nation. Donations and dedicated volunteers have continued the operation of this program for over a decade, a program that few other VA sustain. The program I'm talking about demonstrates kindness through the simple free cup of coffee, hot chocolate, or cider for our veterans. Thanks to the dedication from Joe's Coffees, Soldiers Angels, DAV Chapter 14, American Legion Post 70, American Legion Post 77, American Legion Post 2, VFW AMVETS, Marine Corps League, SAL, American Legion Auxiliary, VFW Auxiliary, and DAV Auxiliary, just to name a few in this community. Here this day, I encourage this county to join the list and become an active community partner, supporting the Charles George VA's Coffee for Veterans program. Send a check, a check today to the Office of Development and Civic Engagement, 1100 Tunnel, 1100 Tunnel Road, Asheville, North Carolina, 2805. The county support would help ensure veterans of today and tomorrow and beyond have the opportunity for social engagement, a thank you message, and a digital access to information about the benefits earned through military service. Benefits that bring this county over $90 million a year in compensation alone. That's why DAV encourages this county to increase the pay and staffing for our veteran service officers. Additionally, we encourage this board to pass a resolution supporting the expansion of tax exemption for veterans, pass a resolution supporting North Carolina House Bill 139, American Made Flag, and pass a resolution today supporting tax exemption for emergency responders. DAV can be reached at DAV14.org or by calling 828-367-0037. In closing, the Disabled American Veterans Chapter 14 accomplishes our mission by ensuring that veterans and their families can access the full range of benefits available to them, fighting for the interests of America's injured heroes on Capitol Hill, and educating the public about the great sacrifices of veterans returning back to civilian life. We thank you, and I yield back. All right, thank you, Andrew. All right, the next person that signed up is um, and I apologize if I mispronounced anyone's name, um, Guy Skinner. All right, thanks. Anyway, I'm here to, my name is Dr. Guy Skinner. I'm here to advocate for McCormick Field and the Asheville Tourists. I've been to the Asheville area since 1940s when my, no, I haven't been 40s. My grandmother moved here in the 40s. I can't imagine how it was then, but I was born in the 50s, and I came here every summer and spent summers here going to McCormick Field. I can still close my eyes and remember the air and the heat. Anyway, Asheville Tourist Baseball is a big community thing. Our friends come from out of state, and they have two things they want to see. They, one of them is their favorite restaurant, but they also, everybody wants to come to an Asheville tourist game. Everybody that comes recognizes that, in their opinion, McCormick Field is the nicest, most quaint, comfortable, homey baseball stadium around. We realize it needs a, a few tweaks here and there, but it's a great place. And we recognize the fact, as did the city council people, that family is is important and that's one of the few places that families can go for a family outing i mean you can't take your kid to the microbrewery or you can but but i mean family is is very important and the people that work there from brian to larry to Alyssa to hannah to the ushers everybody treats you great like family we go three times a week and we we can't imagine what Asheville would be like if it went on the way of Johnson City or Elizabethtown and lost their baseball team. Anyway, please, I, I, I beg you to vote for McCormick Field and the improvements. It means a lot to all of us and, and our friends. Thank you. That, I, I can give somebody else my other minute then. Thank you. Okay, next is Dee Dee Stiles. My name is Dee Dee Stiles and I live in Swannanoa. Buncombe County is a headwaters area. The people getting their water from the Burnett Reservoir get their water straight from the heights of Craggy through the water pipes into their homes. 
But that is not the end of the water story. From each house and business, most of the water goes to the sewage treatment plant to be cleaned and then into the French Broad River. From there, it takes the long way to eventually join the Mississippi River to make it to the Gulf of Mexico. Along the way, it passes cities that take the water for their citizens from the river. We are lucky to get the water first, fresh from the mountain. But that privilege comes with a great responsibility to be good stewards of not only the quality, but also the quantity of water we send along to others downstream. Of course, a lot of the water we send downstream does not pass through Asheville's water system. Here in Buckham County, we are completely within the borders of our county, the Swannanoa River. If that river is muddy and carrying silt and trash and toxic chemicals, we did that. If, that, if the rain runs off instead of soaking into the mountains, causing high water in rainy times and running too low in dry times, we are responsible. And if we want the water to join the French Broad River and at a steady flow, we can do that. The water is not just our water. That water belongs to everyone down the river. Of course, only a small part of the water cities use downstream from us comes from Buncombe County. Other headwater areas need to be good stewards of their water too. Buncombe County could take the lead in caring for the water that is sent down the river. Buncombe County could be the show place for how headwater areas care for their water. But we can't do that if we keep covering up our steep mountainsides with impervious surface like rooftops and roads. Cities downstream depend on headwater areas to provide them with good, steady water. Buncombe is only a small part of that system, but as has been true of many problems before, you are either part of the solution or you are part of the problem. Buncombe County can either be part of the solution or we will be part of the problem. If we take care of our steep mountainsides, we could be part of showing other headwater areas how to be part of the solution. Thank you. Thank you. And the last person that signed up is Anthony Pena. Him, right. Hi. Hi. Uh, hello, my name is Anthony Pena. I'm the Executive Director for the American Foundation for Informed Consent. I'm here to provide you information regarding long COVID. Uh, specifically, its cause, biomarkers, uh, way to diagnosis, as well as treatment. Uh, and this is uh, related from uh, research that has been done by Dr. Bruce Patterson, who is the president of Incel DX. He is a world expert on chemokines and cytokines, which are like the neurotransmitters for your immune system. The immune system has a chemical interaction, and those are cytokines and chemokines. And Dr. Bruce Patterson is considered the world expert. He has treated over, well, last year it was 30,000 patients uh, for long COVID. And what he has found is that long COVID is a result of the S1 subunit for the spike protein being present in non-classical monocytes, which can last for 15 months. Uh, and essentially what's occurring is that the non-classical monocytes are binding to fractal kind, which lines the endothelial pathways of every cell of your body, and it resets, uh, and it is not uh, it, it, under, it undergoes a senescence program. It doesn't undergo apoptosis. It like resets its clock to where it continues to go on. And it acts as a reservoir for what is the most pathogenic part of COVID-19, which caused the public health emergency. And long COVID being defined by the Department of Health and Human Services as a disability is something which needs to be brought to the attention of the public, must be addressed, and at the very least, disclosure should be given to those who are being presented with anything that is presenting the spike protein for the original alpha strain B117, which caused the original uh, public health emergency to occur in the first place to be given to the public. So uh, what I've uh, provided to the clerk is, uh, and, and hopefully to you all as a handout, I can provide this to you in, in the media as well, uh, to a lecture that Dr. Bruce Patterson gave at an immunology conference in Georgetown, as well as two peer-reviewed research uh, reviews. Ultimately, 
the treatment for COVID-19 uh, occurs when the senescence pathway uh, is interrupted and it's a CCR5 antagonist. What he uses is Maraviroc, M-A-R-A-V-I-R-O-C. It has a very good safety profile. Children have used it for years, no problem. In this case, we're looking at an acute setting to allow for these non-classical monocytes to pass and essentially clear. And when they clear, the pathology that has resulted from the spike protein being within the body, which is multitudinous, and I've documented it at forward questions here, fwdquestionshere.com. Again, Anthony Ping, the American Foundation for Informed Consent. Many blessings. All right, thank you. Um, are there any other members of the public who wish to address the board during public comment? All right, thank you all for who took time to come out and share your perspective for the board. <clears throat> the next item on the agenda, um, under good news, is the recognition of Taylor Jones as a top 100 influencer in local government. And Alex uh, McKnight, I think from Emergency Services Finance Manager, our Emergency Services Finance Manager, uh, will present this item. Thank you for being here. Good evening, Commissioners. Good evening. My name is Alex McKnight, a business manager for emergency services. I'm here to help recognize Taylor Jones, our emergency services director. Uh, Taylor Jones has been recognized by engaging local government leaders, better known as ELGO, as a top 100 influencer in local government. ELGO is an organization that engages in the brightest minds of local government. Uh, this recognition highlights the incredible people who work for towns, cities, counties, and districts. It focuses on an individual's influence inside the community and outside also uh, through professional associations, mentoring, and writing. Most importantly, everyone on this list was nominated by either a friend or a peer or a colleague uh, who thinks that that person is doing amazing work. Since taking on this role as Director of Emergency Services, Taylor has worked to advance improvements in the community as well as uh, inside emergency services uh, staff. Despite a pandemic, uh, national recruitment and retention, workforce deficits, as well as uh, a countywide 50% increase in EMS uh, calls for service, Taylor centers his leadership style around equity, inclusion, and staff development. Please help me congratulate Taylor on this very notable recognition. Great job, Taylor. Congratulations. I believe you had a few words, too. Come on up, Taylor. Congratulations. <laughs> Chairman, commissioners, it is humbling to re be recognized by my peers. I am overwhelmed by the support shown to me by county leadership as well as my daily operational team. They surround me with confidence every day to support our citizens in their worst time of need. I would like to take a moment to recognize the reason for this recognition. It's quite simply the work that men and women who answer the call to help during the community's time of need. They rise to the call during what are arguably some of the worst days in the lives of our residents and visitors. Over the last three years, our public safety communication dispatchers, our emergency medical service providers, our emergency management team, our law enforcement and fire service teams have been dedicated <clears throat> their time and effort and resources to uplift and serve and save and protect their community during the face of a global pandemic, civil unrest, the opioid epidemic, Tropical Storm Fred that received the presidential uh, declaration, disaster declaration, but also during all kinds of crazy things we've never thought of about workforce shortages and supply chain shortages 
And sometimes we've all felt like, well, what's next? It's come at us from every angle. But what I want to tell you is I stand in front of you all today except this recognition on behalf of my team. It has been a unique time for our team. Um, they keep standing up and serving well with a smile on their face with little rest. To our men and women of emergency services, I accept this re recognition on your behalf for a job well done because the credit revolves around my team because they do amazing work. They're the true trailblazers and innovators of Buncombe County, saving lives every day with their skill and expertise. I also would be remiss if I didn't thank our county manager's office and Avril Pender for her leadership as well as our commissioner's leadership. Y'all provided us with leadership and support through the last three years. They have saved countless lives and made a real difference in our community. And for that, I thank y'all and I thank our team for everything they do every day to save lives in Buncombe County and support y'all give them. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor. Great job. All right, the next item on our agenda is a proclamation recognizing Women's History Month and County Commissioner Terry Wells is going to read the proclamation and Assistant County Manager D.K. Wesley uh, is here with us on this item as well. And others, thank you all for being here. <laughs> and friends. And this is for all the women across Buncombe County. County of Buncombe Proclamation Women Histories Month. Whereas March is nationally recognized as Women's History Month, and whereas Buncombe County is proud to join the nation's celebration of Women's History Month and the 2023 theme, Celebrating Women Who Tell Stories, Who Tell Our Stories, which honors women in every community who have de devoted their lives and talents to producing art, pursuing truth, and reflecting the human condition decade after decade, and whereas American women of every race, class, and ethnic background have made historic contributions to our nation and community in countless recorded and unrecorded ways, and whereas Buncombe County is committed to creating an inclusive community that celebrates diversity and ensures all residents have equitable opportunities to lead healthy, peaceful, safe, and sustainable lives. And whereas, whether serving in elected positions across America, leading groundbreaking civil rights movements, venturing into unknown frontiers, or programming revolutionary technologies, generations of women that knew their gender was no obstacle to what they could accomplish have long stirred new ideas and opened new doors, having a profound and positive impact on our community. And whereas American women have played and continue to play a critical economic, cultural, and social roles in every sphere of life, uh, constituting a significant portion of the labor force working inside and outside of the home. And whereas American women were particularly important in the establishment of early charitable, philanthropic, and cultural institutions in our communities. And whereas American women have served our country courageously in the military, and whereas American women have been leaders not only in securing their own rights of suffrage and equal opportunity, but also in the abolitionist, emancipation, labor, civil rights, justice, and other movements. And whereas despite these contributions, the role of women in American history has often been overlooked and undervalued in literature, education, and culture. Now therefore, be it resolved that on this 21st day, of March 2023, the Buncombe County Board of Commissioners does hereby proclaim March 2023 as Women's History Month, a time to celebrate the important contributions that women have made to our families, our stories, our community, our state, and our nation. Signed, Brownie Newman, Chairman, Board of Count Buncombe County Board of Commissioners. Wow, what a beautiful 
proclamation. Thank you so much. My name is Diana Sierra. My pronouns are she, her, Aya, and I am the CEO of the YWCA of Asheville. Um, I'm here with some of our staff and board, and I want to take a moment to thank county commissioners, county leadership, and staff for honoring the YWCA of Asheville to, to be a, a recipient of this proclamation um, of Women's History Month. The YWCA of Asheville, our mission is to eliminate racism, empower women, and promote peace, justice, freedom, and dignity for all. At the YWCA of Asheville, we combine advocacy and programming in order to generate institutional change for over 3,000 community members annually. Our services advance racial justice, empower women, promote health, and nurture children. We have been a part of the Asheville community fighting racism and gender inequality since 1907. And while we are proud of our accomplishments, as this proclamation attests, there's still a lot more work for us to do when we talk about gender equity. Currently, the YW is led by an all-women identifying board, an all-women identifying leadership team, and 83% of our staff are women. As we accept the Women's History Month proclamation, we know that all aspects of our community are made more impactful, more vibrant, and more collaborative by the presence and role of women in our community. And the YW is humbled and proud to be a part of the work that's happening every day, and we celebrate those accomplishments with you all. So thank you so much. Thank you, Diane. All right, thank you all for being with us, and thank you, Commissioner, for reading the proclamation. All right, we do not have any public hearings. Ms. Pinder, do you have any items under the county manager's report? Yes, sir, I have two items. First, I want to introduce to you our new Chief Equity and Human Rights Officer, Dr. Norielle Armstrong. Norielle, would you come forward? So Dr. Armstrong, she's originally from Texas, but she has made Asheville her home for the past seven years. She earned her doctorate in counselor education and supervision from the University of Texas at San Antonio. Dr. Armstrong is a licensed clinical mental health counselor supervisor, a national certified counselor, and licensed chemical dependency counselor. She, served, she previously served as CEO and executive director of A Therapist Like Me, a nonprofit organization here in Asheville that's aiming to decrease mental health stigma. Dr. Armstrong is a former high school American Sign Language teacher and uses her knowledge of ASL and the deaf community to advocate for better mental health practices within that community. She worked as a counselor at Marisol University. She teaches at Lenore Ryan University and is a former associate professor at Montreat College. Dr. Armstrong is active in the community working with local churches, learning centers, and the YWCA. Please help me to welcome her to the county. Welcome, Dr. Armstrong. Great. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. My second item, you may recall that we did an RFP for public art a couple months ago. I will ask Rachel Sawyer Nygaard to share with you the results of that RFP. Good evening, commissioners. It has been since August of 2022 that we have talked with you about this project, so I'm pleased to be here this evening um, on behalf of Avril as part of the county manager's report to let you know about how the project is going. This uh, call for artist submissions um, was um, formed as a way to engage in public art to beautify public spaces while advancing the theme of equity. We issued the call for submissions in October 2022 with responses due in November. Our selection committee reviewed proposals and interviewed finalists through January. And this evening, we'll, we will be announcing the selected artists, and implementation will begin as early as next month. We formed a selection committee representing a diverse set of perspectives. We drew first from Buncombe County's Equity and Inclusion Work Group, and then filled in and rounded out that team with perspectives and expertise like 
community engagement and general services, and also included some community partners from City of Asheville Public Art, from the Asheville Area Arts Council, which is now known as ArtsAVL, as well as um, Asheville Creative Arts. So thank you to the folks whose names are on the screen for all of the participation and work um, on this project so far. The selection criteria that the committee looked at um, were across these five categories that are listed here. We were looking for proposals that would amplify our sense of place, that would embody the equity theme, that would add beauty to our public spaces and be high quality work. We were thrilled to have received 21 uh, proposals or submissions in, in response to that call for proposals that we put out. And the selection committee narrowed down to five finalists and ultimately to the three awards that we'll announce this evening. The locations that were identified as part of that call for submissions were first the Register of Deeds building, which is located at 205 College Street with the mural wall being the one that faces the courthouse. The second being a 150 foot plus wall, uh, long wall along Hilliard Street, which is actually behind the county's tax office, uh, which is located around the corner at 94 uh, Cox Avenue. And third, the exterior of the College Street parking deck, which is next door to where we are this evening. So without further ado, uh, please meet the selected artist, Gabriel Eng Getz, who will be doing a mural for the Register of Deeds building, uh, Leslie Reynalte Yanko, uh, who will be doing the Hilliard Street Wall, and Leslie is here with us this evening, as well as Jared, who is here, who will be doing, uh, Jared Wheatley, the College Street parking deck. And I'll tell you a little bit more about each of these artists and their proposals beginning with Gabriel. Um, he is an artist whose studio is based in Durham, uh, North Carolina. His work explores the cultural history of identity, including his own as an Asian American born and raised in the South, our human connection to the natural world. Outside of creating artwork for clients and collectors, he works with his community to show, showcase and uplift North Carolina's vibrant and diverse art scene. This project features a community engagement process with a specific focus on the nearby neighborhoods that will inform the specific design. Gabe will be mentoring an artist apprentice as part of the project, uh, which will be a young person from Buncombe County. Some of his sample work is shown on the screen. For example, in the center is an image of a, a mural that he created last year uh, with the city of Morganton and Burke County Arts Council. <coughs> Leslie is a young adult native to the Asheville area, graduate of Buncombe County Schools. Would you wave, Leslie? Thank you. Um, after graduating from high school and obtaining an associate in fine arts from AB Tech, uh, she was driven to start her own business devoted to murals, illustrations, and graphic design. Art has always had a significant place in her life and she is excited to add color to our everyday lives. This draft mur mural concept that you see on the screen is featured, um, which will be featured on that Hilliard Street wall, has 12 faces, each representing a member of the Latino community within our society with a quote in the center that trans in, written in Spanish that translates to English, you are Latin pride. For this project, Leslie is partnering with technical advisors and prominent local art artists in our community, Gus Cuddy and Catherine Crawford. And Leslie will also be partnering with Asheville Area Arts Council, now known as Arts AVL, uh, for fiscal sponsorship of the project. And thirdly is Jared, who I'm hoping will also wave. Um, Jared Wheatley. Uh, is the selected artist for the College Street Parking Deck. You might be familiar with Jared from his work 
with the Indigenous Walls Project, which works to enhance awareness of Indigenous people, history, and culture. The draft concept here is a communal basket where the traditional basket weave patterns and syllabary are implemented on a grand scale to create both a sense of welcoming and awe for native and ancestral stewards of Buncombe County. The community engagement component of Jared's project will involve coordination via the structures within the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians for input on design and syllabary. Uh, which is the patterns and the, the language which are used in the piece. Back in December, uh, this board of county commissioners approved $153,438 to establish a public art fund. Um, that was through an unrestricted one-time source of funds that came to us through the federal government's fund called Local Assistance and Tribal Consistency Fund. Um, the total project cost for the Creative Equity Mural Project will come in at under 100,000, uh, leaving us about 55,000 uh, to apply to future public art projects. Uh, we hope that the Creative Equity Mural Project will be the start of much more public art to come and some great ideas have surfaced um, in our collaboration so far. And for now, we will continue focusing on fully implementing um, these murals that we've presented to you this evening. Artists will coordinate the community engagement pieces and secure county approval for their final designs. While we expect and hope that the uh, installation of the murals will be completed much sooner, likely this summer, uh, we have given a time frame of up to 12 months for all three murals to be finalized and we uh, will collaborate with the artists to promote the work. We will implement a maintenance plan uh, to, and display the work. Our commitment is to keep it up for a period of not less than five years, um, notwithstanding any unforeseen circumstances, of course, um, and we, we fully expect that these works of art will make contributions to our community that will lead Buncombe County to choose to display them much longer, um, but that's our initial commitment. So at this time, I will respond to any questions from the board and defer, of course, to, to Leslie or Jared if you have questions specific to their, to their works of art. Well, I'll just say thank you. I'm, I'm very excited to see this project come to fruition. I'll echo that. I'm, I'm really excited to see where this goes and applaud your, your efforts in picking some really interesting creative folks from our community. Yeah. I think this is really cool. Um, and I just want to thank the staff for going through with this. It's, it's not, I'm sure not in every county staff would be open to this idea, especially, you know, one of those is a six story building. So that's, that's going to be pretty unique and really cool. Um, so thank you for working through, through this and allowing this to happen um, on the on the Hilliard Avenue project specifically, um, when you're standing right in front of that wall, you're basically standing in the uh, the lane of traffic. So at, at the risk of sounding like everyone's dad, I hope we can work closely with APD to make sure they can paint that safely. But that is a narrow uh, place without a sidewalk. So we've been doing some strategizing on the safest ways to get that accomplished. Cool really exciting. I also want to note um, the incredible talent that we have locally who were also trained locally by our local community college. I know Mr. Wheatley also attended AB Tech alongside Leslie um, just a few years apart from each other, but just such a testament to what great talent we have being trained here locally. All right, Rachel, thanks for the updates. Congratulations and appreciation to all the artists who'll be working with the community. Thank you so much. Great job. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. That's my report. All right. No items under old business. We come to new business. The first item is uh, the open space bond conservation criteria adoption. And Jill Hi. Carter, I think, is here to help us with this item along with some other staff as well. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Okay. All right. Online, yes. <laughs> Virtually, yes. <laughs> Thank you for being with us. Um, hey, Ariel. Great. 
thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank the commissioners for allowing me to join you tonight, um, albeit virtually. My colleague Ariel Zeit and I are here to first give a brief overview of the open space bond and an update on progress. And then Ariel is going to present the evaluation criteria for conservation projects to be funded through this bond. And we are going to ask that you adopt that criteria. As a quick refresher, the open space bond was one of two general obligation bonds voted for in a referendum this past November. And the open space bond allocates $30 million towards three types of projects land conservation, greenways, and passive recreation lands. Each of these uh, bond components will operate under its own application process, whereby we will receive project proposals, staff will review those proposals and evaluate them against um, individual evaluation criteria for each project type. And then an advisory board for each component will review the project proposals and recommend projects for funding to the commission. We are currently in the process of developing the evaluation criteria for each of these project types. And the land conservation evaluation criteria is the first to come to the commissioners for adoption. So where are we now with the open space bond? Um, first, each of those advisory boards that I just mentioned has been selected. Additionally, uh, as you know, the commissioners appointed the members for the Community Oversight Committee, which is responsible for the financial and legal oversight of both general obligation bonds. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce has also appointed the, their member of that committee as well. Uh, second, the project manager for the Open Space Bond, which is myself, has been hired. And our team has been hard at work with some community outreach to keep the public um, up to date on the bond and to provide opportunities for public input, which I'll go into further detail momentarily. As I mentioned, we are in the process of developing that evaluation criteria for each project bucket. And that criteria is all expected to be complete by the end of June, 2023. That completion date will allow us to move into project selection for uh, the conservation easement projects. And we anticipate that we will be able to select the first conservation project to receive bond funding in the summer of this year. We will also be able to uh, move into the application window for passive recreation projects. And we anticipate that that window will open in the fall of this year. And finally, we'll be able to begin um, allocating funding towards those two shovel ready projects um, under the Greenways component which are the Woodfin Greenway and the Enfa Heritage Trail. And as a last update, as I briefly touched on before, um, a key goal of both this bond and our team is to maintain regular communication with the public about the bond. And this is not only being transparent about progress um, in our in our process for project selection, but also soliciting public input and feedback on what types of projects uh, the Buncombe community would like to see funded through this bond. And we have a few tools that we've um, put together with the communications team towards this end. The first of which is a public input page website, which went live on March 1st. Um, you can see a quick screen grab of that website to the right. Uh, this website provides some great educational content on the open space bond, the types of projects that can be funded, and our process for project selection and oversight. Additionally, we will be launching public input surveys throughout the bond process. And these surveys will give the public the opportunity to provide comment on the evaluation criteria, the uh, project application process, and the project selection process. And finally, throughout the life of the bond, we are going to continue this communication and outreach with the general public um, through both that website, the surveys, and other communication channels of the county to make sure that the public understands not only the status of the bond, progress on the projects that receive funding, but also how they can participate in the bond process, including public meetings, public comment opportunities, and so on. 
And with the conclusion of my update, I would like to introduce my colleague, Ariel Veit. Ariel is the Farmland Preservation Manager, and she was um, instrumental along with the rest of the Farmland Preservation team in developing the criteria that you are going to see tonight. Thanks, Jill. I think we're working on getting it switched over to my presentation, but good evening, commissioners. Thank you for having us. Let's see. All right. So um, we came back, I guess we were here last in December of last year, so I'm going to do a bit of a recap of what we shared at the previous briefing. Um, so we, we have two advisory boards that oversee our land conservation program. Um, these boards have some, some differences and special focuses. So um, first, we have the Land Conservation Advisory Board, um, which I may refer to as LCAB. Um, but this board uh, really funds um, nonprofit land trust projects. So that's the main focus of this board is to provide um, funding for these conservation easements. Um, the focus areas for these uh, projects uh, are pretty uh, broad. We have wildlands, view sheds, um, farmlands, forest lands, um, stream uh, riparian easements, and public benefit easements. Um, the second board that we have working on the easement process is the Agricultural Advisory Board. So this board really oversees um, the county-led farmland preservation program. And so that is the, the main program that's eligible for those um, the funding through that board. So. Our main focus area for this board is mostly farm and forest land within the county. So both boards follow a very similar evaluation system, um, looking at kind of a two-tiered um, system. So first we rank the land using specific criteria to each board, and then um, we determine the funding source and the amount that the project is eligible for. So. Um, we determine if a project um, is eligible for a variety of grant funds um, or uh, funding from our general fund um, that uh, you fund a certain amount uh, for. And the other option now we have is for bond funds. So we try to be strategic in, in what projects go where and make sure we're leveraging as much funding as possible. Um, and so part of that determining um, the funding is determining if um, a project is going to just get transaction costs or a mixture of transaction cost and easement purchase. So this is just a snapshot at uh, one of the flow charts we've created um, to explain the Ag Advisory Board process. We have a very similar one for the uh, Land Conservation Board process. Um, where at the beginning we, um, we rank each project individually and then um, at the, the, the kind of second stage of the flowchart is explaining the uh, funding source and the amount. So um, I'll go over the Ag Advisory Board project evaluation system. Just a quick reminder, um, Ag Advisory Board is funding count the county-led farmland preservation program, mostly focusing on farm and forest land. So, this really is broken into two sections. We're looking at land evaluation, which is really focused on the soil type. Yep. Are these the Ag Advisory Board's existing evaluation ranking systems, or was this developed in response to the bond? This is the existing system for both boards. Okay. Yeah. Um, the, the proposal that, is, um, that has been developed specifically for the bond is on the next slide. So we'll, we'll talk specifically on bond funds, but both of these board, um, boards are using their current evaluation system. That have, they've both been recently up, um, updated within probably the last year, so it's, it's um, very current. So um, yes, the land valuation focuses on um, farm and forest land soils to really uh, encourage that we're having prime agricultural soils on these properties. And then we also take into account um, a site assessment, determining the clustering potential, making sure we're, we're really getting the most impact for our conserved land by um, lumping the land you know, together in certain regions of the county. Um, so that's that contiguous land preservation. We're also trying to um, really encourage the land stewardship of you know, the property owner. Are they taking good care of the property? 
Um, are there you know, scenic and environmental qualities to protect? And then we take into account uh, the development pressure of that region. So this evaluation system is a weighted sum. So each category, as you can see, has some weight given to it. And then this is specifically what we created to determine if a project is eligible for bond funds. So really what, we, um, what we'll see here is within the first yellow box, um, each board has determined kind of their top criteria that they wanna make sure that um, a easement purchase project would meet. So we need to meet at least two of these following criteria. And so for the Ag Advisory Board, um, here's a few examples of the criteria. Um, is it within one of the farmland priority regions that we've we brought to the to the commission, I guess maybe six months ago, with a, with an example of what these focus areas are. So that's that's one of the options. Um, is it close in proximity to other protected lands? Does it have prime, uh, unique, and locally important soils? Um, is this a project of significant environmental or scenic importance? Um, is it an active or working uh, farm or a, a century farm that's been around for at least 100 years? Um, and then another example is, is it of significant size? Is, um, you know, is it a lot of acres <laughs> that we could really make a big impact with? Um, and then lastly, um, is this a time-sensitive project? Sometimes uh, when we have to apply for grant funds to fund a project, that can take many years to go through. So if it's a time-sensitive project, forced sell, development pressure, those types of things, or an elderly landowner, that might um, make it more a possibility to do this, this easement where we wouldn't have the time to, to wait around on grant funds. So once we've met at least two of these criteria, um, this uh, determines that this project is eligible for county uh, bond funds uh, for easement purchase up to 50% of the easement value. So um, that just means they're eligible, doesn't mean they're approved. So then we, we have to start that evaluation process that I mentioned on the previous slide. So that would still mean that the board evaluates each project individually, they visit the site, and um, eventually vote to move forward with the project and then bring it to the commissioners for final approval. So similarly, this is um, the system proposed from the LCAB board. This is the current system that they are using. And the uh, Land Conservation Advisory Board, just as a reminder, is funding land, uh, land trust easements. And they have a variety of, um, of focus, wildlife, biological values, water quality, and more. So first, we evaluate um, the land trust partner themselves. Um, have, do they have a good organization uh, track record? Um, have they upheld the county investment um, of other projects over the years? Um, you know, project completion in the past and that kind of thing. And then we look at the conservation value of each project. So we're looking at view shed protection, natural areas, um, water quality. They also look at farmland preservation and other um, resource protection. So that's, that's kind of the, um, the similar ranking system that we are currently using with LCAP. And then specifically with how the bond funds could be used, they also need to meet at least two of these criteria. There are some similar criteria for the Ag Advisory Board, but this is specific to LCAB. Is it within an LCAB priority region? Um, is, does it have significant um, environmental or scenic importance? Does it have a potential recreation opportunity or water quality or open space benefits? Um, and then also, is it a time sensitive project? So if that is the case, then they would be eligible for at least 25 to 50% of easement value funding. But they would still have to start that um, LCAB project approval process and follow that ranking system. So each, each project, project is still ranked individually. So we're making sure we're, we have high quality projects. Um, and so then the LCAB board would still have to uh, vote on the project and if approved, um, that would then come to the commissioners for final approval and a budget request. Are there any questions?
Well, I just want to go ahead and say thank you to staff and the dedicated volunteers that are serving on the Ag Advisory Board and the Land Conservation Board because I know they have put a lot of thought into this. It's been a very thorough uh, and thoughtful deliberations around this because they really wanted to, even though they had this other criteria and a really solid program, they wanted to ensure with the bond pr process that they're prioritizing projects for that with those bond funds to ensure transparency and to also make sure we're having very effective and impactful use of these public funds. So thank you to staff and all those volunteers for the time they've put into that. Mm -hmm. Hey, I do have a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. So these are, again, these are, these are criteria that sort of have existed for a while though, right? Um, that they've been using to evaluate projects for, you know, for many years now, right? So I guess just, you know, the, and I think, uh, you know, a lot of this makes great sense and great, um, sounds like a great process. I guess the, um, a couple of questions. One is, you know, with all of the bond funds that we've, uh, the voters have approved, obviously we want them to, to create the maximum potential, you know, benefit, right? Like we've set these goals and even though this is a lot of money in the big scheme of things, it's not that much money. So we, so I guess one of my questions would be, and sort of for both of them, I see under the LCAB project evaluation criteria, there is a um, funding leverage mm -hmm. uh, component. You get, I guess, up to 15 points if you're leveraging a lot. Um, but there isn't for the Ag Advisory Board. Mm -hmm. Am I reading that right? Or Because, I mean, you know, let's just say there's two, hypothetically, two I, I identical projects, right? Like identically, like they score the same, right? So they're, from a public interest standpoint, they're, um, they're both really good. But if in one of them, let's say the property owner's like, well, I, I just, you know, I'm willing to donate more of my development rights, right? Or maybe there's some grant that would come in so that the county's portion would be much less, right? So, you, so maybe just, it would cost the county half as much funding to protect one project and the other, they're otherwise equally beneficial. You know, I would say like, I'd like, you know, we only have this much money, we wanna protect as much as we can, so let's, let's factor in the cost effectiveness kind of aspect to this, which, which projects, you know. So I'm just kind of curious how that gets, how that would be thought about, or is that something that we, we ought to develop some additional criteria around? I mean, in, in some ways, I think these criteria all sound, make a lot of sense for how we've been doing it in the past, where the county's investment levels have been, you know, really very modest, right? So we're not kind of, uh, our, the amount we're putting in was never that much. But now that we've got voter approved bonds, like our, our investment levels could be much more significant, right? And therefore the kind of the cost effectiveness aspect to it seems like maybe it gets it should get additional um, weight. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I think the, the main difference between um, the funding sources that each board has is that our Ag Advisory Board is just that county-led farmland preservation program. So um, we have the leverage of the landowner donation um, for a project, and sometimes we would maybe would get partial bond, I mean partial grant funds, um, but we don't have access to private donations or, or philanthropic, you know, funding like a local land trust would. So sometimes they are able to leverage a bit more of funding than our county program, just because the county program is mostly funded by the county. Um, but I, I will say all easement projects always have at least a 25% don 20, 25 donation of value from the landowner, and most of the time it's at least 50% from our projects. But so um, it's kind of hard to compare both boards because let's of that. Just stay, let's just stay on the ag, let's take them yeah. one at a time then. Okay. Right? So, because they are, they are similar but, but unique. Mm -hmm. but let's stay on ag advisory board. So this is really, these are projects where a landowner's like, I'm, I wanna voluntarily protect this property for the future. I'm willing to donate some of my development, mm -hmm. uh, the market value of the development rights uh, to do a conservation easement, which is great that anyone would be willing to do that Okay, but again, now that we have this additional pool of funding, right, like there might be, I mean, there have been tons of projects where people are like, if you'll just cover like the transaction cost, mm -hmm. I'll do a project, right? Like a ton of amazing projects happen that way. Mm -hmm. Now that there are more financial resources at play here, I mean, the, the pipeline of potential projects might grow substantially now that it's like, well, look, you actually could get paid for a very high percentage of your development 
value, development values in our community are through the roof, right? So I don't know, I guess I'm just thinking like maybe there should be some additional weight here because if one person's willing to donate 75% of their development value and someone else is like, I want the maximum amount of compensation, then, you know, I, that seems like a really important factor to just one of several factors to take into consideration. So I'm sure the group probably would think about those things, but if we're approving criteria, it seems like it ought to be on the list. And Gary, what are your thoughts? Certainly just, yeah. Yes, that was discussed in the Ag Advisory, and I think if you, I'm not sure if Ariel went over this when she did the presentation, but there's a flow chart there that kind of looks at easement funding, and that is around the Ag Advisory Board. Mm -hmm. Is that on your presentation? Yes. Okay. Yeah. If you look at that chair, I think it, it addresses some of what you're talking about because then there's there's a there's that kind of prioritization. Look, show me where it is on here. So there's a fl the full page of the flow chart. Um, basically, if you uh, if you can kind of zoom it, well, we can't zoom in it, but I can explain. Um, once a project is ranked, we determine where the funding source is coming from. And so in this uh, kind of process, we are trying to max, or well, we're trying to maximize our leveraged opportunities. So we are saying, okay, does it need funding, uh, easement funding, yes or no? If it's a donation easement, it pretty much uh, bypasses the, the rest of the funding discussion and it goes straight to the board um, for their review. Um, if it does need funding, um, we first always explore grant funding opportunities and make sure that um, that we're putting the best possible uh, projects towards the towards the grant, so we maximize our chance of getting um, them funded. And uh, to so for specifically for this board, there are um, just two grants that we apply for. One is a federal, and one is a state and each um, have limited funds as well as caps on the amount of applications an entity can submit. So typically we try to put the best four forward every year and then um, if, if you know, there's projects still wanting to move forward, at that point um, we would have explored all other funding potentials and um, be able to move forward to bond funds. So we're always trying to make sure we're leveraging and, and that is, uh, it's some, somewhat captured here um, but if you feel like there needs to be more, we can. I don't think it is. I mean, honestly, I just, I mean, I, if we can get a grant, great. But in terms of like, for most projects, it sounds like there's not grant funding. It's really a question of like how much a property owner uh, needs to uh, be compensated for their development rights in order to feel, you know, like this is a wise decision for them and their family to make. So I don't know, it just seems like it ought to, why, why not put that in there? Uh, I'm sure it's the way the group would probably mostly think about it, but if we're specifically, if the purpose of this is to rank projects, then like why would we not just list that as a criteria? And so what you're suggesting is list that in additional, specifically with for the bond funds, because so on there, there is an automatic assumption that there's donation because it's up to 50% of the easement value. So that means there's going to be... You have to do that much. You have right. to at least 50%. Right. Yeah. A very significant donation. And we also have to remember, well, from our side of things, we have to remember that um, a lot of our landowners can't afford, even a 50% donation of their value is is significant. Like, that's a significant um, <coughs> donation, and especially for our working farms. So. But what you're, let me just make sure, because I understand what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. We, had a, we had lots of discussion around this, yeah. so it's, it's a great point. What, what you're saying is within the bond funds is just to add another kind of category there to make sure that that is part of that discussion and the ranking that those projects are going to be able to leverage the most, whether it's a donation from the landowner or whether it's grant funds, that that is an additional checkpoint to ensure that we are. I would, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, I would predict that with the amount of funding that we have, the voters have approved, that there will be over this period of time, like there will be more projects submitted than we will have funds to allocate to, right? And so if that's the case, then if we wanna fund as many projects as possible, then, 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 cause if, if, if there's a, let's just say there's a bunch of projects where property owners are like, I'm willing to do it for a third of my, on average, like on, for a third of my development rights or development values, then, then we would fund a lot more projects, right? Then if it averages out more like around 50%, I just, I, I bet there's gonna be a lot of 
support for this. I mean, we've seen some, so many property owners, again, just develop, donate all their development rights or, or majority of them. So I just, I'd like for it to be factored in to just make sure we can fund the, as many projects as possible. And the, so. I, I think that, that the board would be fine. Like there's a way just to definitely add in an additional checkpoint there with the bond funds. To, to the, I guess, I mean, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to clarify my thoughts on this before I started. Okay. To the extent that a landowner is willing to donate more than 50% of their development rights, I think it should be ranked higher, I guess would be the simplest way to describe that. So. Yeah, that, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, we can definitely add that in to the, specifically to the Ag Advisory Board. One is that because we already have that as a factor of the uh, it, land It does get some land. points in the other system. So I was mostly okay. thinking of the Ag Advisory right. Board. Yep. Okay, well thank you. I'm, thank you for, for thinking that through. Uh, um, and. Um, and I, okay. Oh, no. it's, I'll wait and see if anybody else had anything. Anything else on this point? I did have one other one, but anything else on kind of the this this leverage aspect? Okay. Um, so I guess the other <laughs> the other question I would I would raise, and again, I feel like this is kind of different now that we've got these voter approved bonds than the way we've thought about this stuff in the past, because there's more money to be invested, right? As opposed to the shoestring approach we've kind of taken to a lot of this more in the past, which is great. Um, and so on one of these, one of these, uh, so, so um, part of the criteria is, you know, looking at soil quality, clustering potential, but part of it's also looking at development pressure, right? Um, but of course there's development pressure to varying degrees all over Buncombe County. And, you know, and farmland can be taken out of farmland by projects that have you know, one house per three acres just as much as they can buy a development with, you know, an apartment building on it, right? Like, it doesn't take a lot of development to convert farmland to, to, to residential use, right? So I guess, um, but when we were going through the whole bond referendum process, you know, when we also passed affordable housing bonds too, right? And so some people would ask us, well, like, how, how do you make, like, on the one hand, you want to you know, support affordable housing. On the other hand, you want to protect land from overdevelopment, right? So how are you going to reconcile these two things? And we'd say, well, we're going to try to take, you know, a thoughtful approach to all of this from a land use standpoint, right? Like the areas that have most of these conservation funds are going to go to, we're going to be working to protect, you know, the really viable areas in our county that have a lot of working farms and the clustering and all that, I think speaks to that. Um, we're not going to put our we're not going to put our conservation dollars into places that are going to be important sites for development of workforce housing or that make that makes sense for like we're a growing community. There's areas that make sense for where that growth should go to. So, so I guess I do have like a little concern about the idea that we would put proximity to water and sewer as like a criteria for what you would steer the conservation dollars to because like it might be. Like that's what on the affordable housing committee we look for to do like great projects on, right? So, so I, I uh, and again, I'm sorry I didn't think, maybe think this through in more detail around what the solution is to that, but I would, um, I would, I would like to kind of suggest that we think about that point a bit more, because if a site is a potentially valuable site for, um, for growth or especially for affordable or workforce housing, then you know we wouldn't want to. Um, steer our conservation dollars into areas where actually it's it's an area that makes a lot of sense for growth. Yeah, absolutely. So, and, and, and pr proximity to water and sewer is definitely one of those main criteria for sure, right? Yes. Yeah. And so, specifically with the Ag <coughs> Advisory Board ranking process, we've we just uh, redid it this past summer um, with quite a bit of research of what other counties and other you know areas around the nation use as their system. So. Avni, our, our farmland preservation coordinator, um, completed a lot of that research and work. And I just didn't know if you'd speak to the specifically the development pressure section. I know that it um, in that weighted uh, criteria, um, it's weighted the lowest, I believe. So it really doesn't give that much um, that much weight yeah. to it, I guess. And Ariel, also, isn't the point that you have to have that in there for those grants? Yes, it's so a that's significant factor in the grant rate. Because we had this discussion as well, Chair, yeah. about whether well, that it gets as many points as these other, it's 100 points yeah. under well, development pressure. Well, weighted at 10%, right. I yeah. think. So a lot of our grants, 
We tried to weight the clustering potential on soils the highest because those, a lot of our grants and other counties focus on those aspects of conservation easements. But a lot of grants also do look at development pressure. And so we wanted to still give opportunity to some farms that are in more urban areas or urbanizing areas, kind of on the, the fr urban fringe. Yeah. So they're not quite in like the city of Asheville or the town of Montreat or anything like that, but they're still close to some developments or in that urban fringe. So we still want to protect and give those types of projects a chance um, and and account for, for protecting those and, and starting to create like a little bit of a boundary of protected areas in or like a buffer into rural areas. Okay. So that we didn't want to take it out completely because then that would affect um, ranking for grant um, funding as well. Do you, do you have to specifically say proximity to water and sewer? Like that's in a way that's kind of like maybe the terminology that would raise the most concerns because it's literally the terminology we use to like cite good projects on the other and so they just seem like, you know, I mean, certainly assessing if there's property that really is not under any realistic development threat, then yeah, I understand like, hey, let's focus on some other things. But because it's, it's the proximity to water and sewer that allows some higher density developments, some of the kind of like multifamily developments of which we are just like, you know, need to build more of. So, so I think assessing development threats certainly makes sense, but that's the specific language that gives me a little bit more heartburn. Perhaps the way to address that would be to map the urban fringe in their minds, to rank it that way, mm -hmm. not use the utility infrastructure. So do you know what is required from the grant perspective? I know you use that language because of the grants very specifically. And just so you know, it's not, I know it looks like a lot when it says 100 points, but it's because they're doing a percentage, which actually it's, it's, a, it's a small part of that ranking because it's, it's like the prime soils, I think, is the largest percentage, whereas that is, what was it, you said 10% or less? Yeah, that whole probably ends up story. being about 10%. Um, but we can, we can research, do more research and find ways to kind of rephrase, and maybe it's not necessarily proximity to water sewer, but other aspects of development pressure. Mm -hmm. Or work. Okay. And, and we definitely created, we have, you know, these focus areas um, of conservation and worked very closely with the, the planning department through the comprehensive plan process to make sure we weren't, um, you know, conflicting with the priorities of development versus um, conservation. But yes, we can definitely um, address that question. Yeah, we did kind of look at the priority map and the future land use map kind of side by side to try and make sure that there weren't any major conflicts there. But there is a significant um, weighting in, in, sub, in both of the grant um, grants that we apply for for development pressure. It's like they want you in that sweet spot. They don't want you all the way in you know the city, but they also um, prioritize um, <coughs> folks that are on the edge. So yeah. Yeah. Well, I, part of the point is like low density development can destroy habitats and take land out of ag land just as much as like a high density development. But the locations we have to do to really do some of these higher density developments are, are frankly very limited in this community. So we have to be, I think, very thoughtful about investing taxpayer dollars into projects that might run contrary to one of our, you know, highest priority <coughs> goals. So, I mean, personally, I'd like to actually defer voting on this to just put a bit more thought into this, and I don't know where to land, but I would, I'd just like to take a little more time. I mean, I think people really, like, I mean, people, we gotta ask that question a lot, of like, how are you gonna make sure these two programs, like, don't run across purposes? So I just, I'd like to think about it a bit more. Um, Terry, what are your thoughts, or other commissioners? I'd be in support of putting some thought into that, making sure we're not walking over ourselves there. It makes sense to, to get it right on, on this kind of issue. There's a way to solve what you're asking for. It's just a matter of putting it on paper. I think it's really close. It's, <laughs> I think, yeah, <laughs> it's just these two points. So would y'all be comfortable taking a little more time and maybe bring it back to either, well, just the next meeting or the one after? We, we would want to make sure we engage the boards again, because to Terry's yeah. point, they did a lot of work on this to make sure that they get their eyes on it again, so. Okay, great. 
All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. These uh, appreciate y'all allow me to kind of raise this question. So um, any other comments or feedback at this time on the criteria? Okay. All right. And I, and I, they are great. Those were the only two parts I wanted to talk about. So. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, all right. Commissioners, the um, next item on the agenda is the resolution requesting quiet zone at private rail crossing. Uh, members of the Board of Commission, I am here uh, on behalf of the legal department. My name is Kurt Euler. Uh, a group of four hotel or, uh, owners who uh, on Tunnel Road in East Asheville near exit 55, uh, which is off Interstate 40, are asking the county commissioners to adopt a resolution requesting Norfolk Southern to establish a quiet zone regarding crossing 95131D. Um, is, the photo, is, is the photograph uh, available that we can put up and show? Um, as you can see, this is a, a, a private uh, crossing that serves a limited number of parcels, a billboard sign, and an MSD easement. Uh, Northfolk Southern was notified of MSD's use of this crossing, and in 2019, uh, per Federal Railroad Administration guidelines, uh, started blowing their train horns. Uh, this, these, this crossing is close to the hotels, and as you can uh, guess, has caused uh, some conflicts with people staying at the hotel. Uh, some things to remember about this request. This is not committing the county to pay any county money. Um, and also, MSD does not have an objection to this request um, as long as their right of access is preserved. So they have a, a right of way to use this access so they can get at their MSD lines on the other side. So really what the hotel owners are asking for is you requesting a resolution requesting that North Fork Southern establish a quiet zone. And Craig Justice is here on behalf of the hotel owners in case you have any more questions regarding this project. The, the easement in question, the easement shown on the map is just buried sewer. That's it's it's not, you, MSD has an easement on the other side, I believe on the other side of the crossing that they have to access to maintain the sewer line. But what we're asking for is a quiet zone, and what a quiet zone is basically a half a mile stretch where trains aren't allowed to blow their horns. So Kurt, just to follow up on our, our questions from last time, th this is really more of a request and, and just kind of resolution supporting the idea that we don't want, we'd ideally like to not see this happen. This isn't a binding or anything that we're gonna get Pulled into. Really, in order to get a quiet zone, the local government has yeah. to put in a request and be in support of establishing the quiet zone. Right. So all you're being asked tonight to do is basically to establish that you support the further application of the quiet zone. There's a lot of other pro processes that will have to take place before it's established. And none of those involve us. That's This is... Not, not to my knowledge, but I'm also not an expert on federal railway law, so. I can't imagine why not. <laughs> <laughs> Trying. <laughs> Is there a motion? I so move. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank you. All right, next up, approval of 911 situational overview and recommendations. And I think Rafael Baptista is here to help us with this item. Good evening, commissioners. Good evening. Second time today. All right, so we're here today to talk about the 911 center and kind of give you a situational overview speak to some recommendations we have for addressing that situation. So we'll talk about what's going on right now and then we'll talk about kind of short-term and long-term strategies for 
how to address um, what's going on in the 911 center. So the 911 center is dealing currently with a critical staffing situation. They've become dependent on off-duty first responders, folks from um, Buncombe County EMS, the Sheriff's Office, APD, AFD, and our local fire districts to be able to meet minimum staffing um, levels within the 911 center. Uh, currently, everyone except the director in the 911 center has been redeployed to work full-time as a telecommunicator. That includes all managers, all trainers, and quality assurance staff. So everyone is working on the floor currently full-time. Um, the first responders from our local agencies are an incredible asset. We wouldn't be able to do what we're doing right now without them, and we're incredibly grateful for them. But the reality is 911 telecommunicators, they're trained professionals who are certified to do a specific job, and the first responders we have in there, we're training them to the best of our ability, but they're not trained and certified to the level of our own staff, so they are limited in the tasks they're able to perform within the 911 center. We have a lack of dedicated supervision and training going on in the center because everyone's working on the floor. So we have individuals who are working there independently answering calls and doing dispatch who normally would still be in a training program. But to meet staffing needs, we have released them onto the floor no earlier than normal. So the current, to run a 911 center, you're supposed to be able to have 67% of the slots within each individual shift staffed. That's the minimum staffing requirement. But if you look at the staffing levels on this table, what you'll see is that even if everyone who is working on that shift shows up to work on every day, so no one takes vacation, no one's sick on any given day, uh, they can't meet that 67% number. Um, so that is the challenge we're having. So we're dependent on the surge staffing, that assistance from our first responders to get to where we need to go. If you look at the call volume, this is a really telling slide. We're the eighth largest county in North Carolina for some context, but we have the sixth highest 911 call volume in the state, and we have the fifth highest call volume to our non-emergency line or administrative line. Um, and administrative line is 60% of the call volume into the 911 center. So it speaks to, the, to just the sheer volume that they're handling in that call center. 60% of calls that go into the 911 center are on that administrative line. So when I look at a 911 center, I look at three performance metrics, right? The first performance metric is how quickly do they, how long does it take them to answer a call? The state standard is 90% of calls should be answered within 10 seconds. Since COVID started, the 911 center has been really bumping around between 88 and 92%. Um, so it's, we're not always able to meet that standard of answering calls quick enough. The second thing I look at is once the call is answered, how long does it take the 911 center to dispatch out a unit, right? And I look at priority fire and EMS calls. These are the calls that really do want to get out there. The standard that we're supposed to be meeting is 64 seconds. Currently, we're at three minutes and 31 seconds. Um, if you look at the numbers and you drive, dive in a little deeper, during the day shift, during the day where we have the highest volume of calls, there are two factors resulting that dispatch time. Factor number one, is as you heard earlier today and at the budget work session recently, due to our, the number of ambulances we have, we have times where we do not have available ambulances to dispatch, so calls are waiting to be dispatched. But the second factor is staffing. At night though, when we have half the call volume, the challenge that we're struggling is our, response, our dispatch times are actually slower at night. But we have enough ambulances at night, we have half the call volume, what is going on is we don't have first responders in the center at the same levels, and we have less staff working in the center at night, so it's much more difficult for them to process the calls in a timely manner. The third metric we look at is our error rate. How often are mistakes being made in the processing and dispatching of calls? At this point, all quality assurance within the 911 center has been redeployed to answer the phones, the dispatch calls. We don't have that error metric currently from the 911 center at this point. So the overall challenges that we're looking at when we look at the 911 Center are one, is vacancies and high turnover within the 911 Center over the last couple of years. They're putting us in this situation. An imbalance of volume of calls to staff capacity within the 911 Center, right? Just the sheer volume of calls is a challenge. Our dependence on local agencies, who we're incredibly grateful for, but at some point they are gonna bring their first responders back in. Um, and technology and facility challenges. 
So as we look from, go from what are the challenges to what are the solutions and strategies that we want to undertake, the first one we want to look at is the stipend pay recommendation. Our recommendation is for telecommunicators, so 911 center staff who have been on the job for at least six months, that's when someone is fully trained and fully independent, they've been there for six months, would receive a stipend for each regularly worked shift as listed in the ch on the chart. So if they worked a day shift, Monday through Friday, they would receive an extra $8 an hour, and on Saturday and Sunday, they would receive an additional $15 an hour. For folks working the night shift, during the week, they would receive an additional $12 an hour, and on the weekends, they would receive an additional $20 an hour. This would continue until we've been able to sustain that 67% staffing level for three months, utilizing only 911 center staff. So essentially being able to run the 911 center staff center the minimum staffing levels with just our staff for three months. The total cost per pay period is around $49,000, um, but we'll be funding this for the remainder of the fiscal year using the lapsed salary, so there is no budget amendment associated with this request. But this is not the only strategy that we're undertaking, so looking at other short-term strategies, one is the reduction of non-911 call volume. I mentioned 60% of calls come into the administrative line, and the reality is the vast majority of those calls are not actually processed in the 911 center. Someone calls the 911 center, the administrative line is answered, they understand what the person wants, and then that person is immediately transferred to another agency. So we're trying to determine abilities to directly send calls elsewhere and reduce some of those calls. We're implementing an automated alarm dispatch system which will reduce the significantly the amount of calls for residential burglary alarms. So instead of necessitating a 911 call, the alarm system will talk directly to our dispatchers and get dispatch down quicker. So improved service to the community and reduction in call volume. We're bringing on contracted support for call taking, training, recruitment, and quality assurance. Additionally, we are providing significant operational and management support to the 911 center from other county departments and we are beefing up staff recruitment um, in the center to try to bring in new individuals. As we pivot for long-term strategies, we are looking at technology and facility improvements. These individuals are working in the, call, in the 911 center 12 hours a day. These are long shifts. We wanna make sure the center is an attractive center to attract a good workforce. We wanna make improvements to center processes and policies. We want to sustain or continue recruitment push we want to create an awareness campaign to help uh, awareness campaign to help connect the community to non-emergency lines. We're examining the base pay or regular pay for 911 telecommunicators, and we're looking to increase EMS capacity within the county to improve those dispatch times. So, with that, I'm happy to take any questions um, that you may have. Any questions, commissioners? Yes, I'd be interested to hear from staff to have them opine on some of those short-term strategies, your optimism around them working, um, do those kind of things like contracted support, um, does that exist in the world? We're working, we, uh, we're actively working on executing contracts on that. Okay. So, yeah, I try to make sure I only brought strategies to you all tonight that are strategies that I feel confident we'll be able to implement. Good. I'd, I'd love an update on this as you roll those out. I know this is a really challenging, stressful job for folks who are in it, and certainly know it's, it's not easy to give up weekends and a job that requires 12-hour shifts. Just briefly want to express appreciation, and it feels like one one theme for this day is that uh, with we have to be thinking about all these systems holistically, certainly, and I'm certainly thinking about the analysis Taylor Jones shared with us in our briefing about uh, the overall EMS system and how that intersects with 911. And it, again, it just feels like that's sort of a compounding um, point that's being driven home, particularly as we kind of um, really take these deeper dives into our work at the intersections of public safety and, um, and, and what it means to actually staff and expand operations against the backdrop of community needs. So uh, I won't go too much further down that rabbit hole, but it, uh, but, uh, it feels like there's sort of echoes happening in one conversation after another that um, we really have to um, 
be prioritizing, be able to prioritize multiple things at once and also um, make sure we're tracking the connections between these different initiatives um, as we move forward. So I, I know a, a, a great deal of hard work um, has gone into this across multiple departments and um, look forward to um, hearing updates as it moves forward. I think this is one of those services that people don't think about until they need to call 911. And it's a service, of course, that we we have to provide. And as a result, I think we, we have to provide the staffing and the pay that's necessary. Um, oftentimes, as we know, these are life or death calls and folks rely on us and our incredible staff to make this happen. Thank you for getting out of the box, so to speak, mm -hmm. so that we can solve this problem. But I don't think we have any choice mm -hmm. but to approve it. So do you need me to make a motion? Sure. I, I move that we... Second. second. All right, there's a motion and second. Further discussion? Um, I'll just <clears throat> make one comment. The uh, I think all the recommendations are, are good. And... Um, and, and um, but in particular, I mean, I think we will really need to look at the base pay. I mean, doing these things to kind of manage the situation in the short term is good, but we, I think we really want to think about, like, what's what do we need to do to attract and retain people long term beyond getting through the the near term needs to, you know, keep it staffed well. And I think this, you know, just like some of the other conversations we had earlier today, I mean, this has always been an important job, but we're just, we're kind of in a different era now, just as a community and some of the different issues that teams like 911 are responding to. So I think we just have to recognize like it's never been an easy job. It's probably tougher now than it's ever been. And that's gonna that's gonna be that way. So we gotta we gotta appropriately value that long term. So thanks for all the great work putting this together. Thank you. Uh, any other feedback? All in favor say aye. 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 All right. Thanks, Raphael. Any opposed? Okay, great. All right. Um, next up is approval of homelessness response regular full time position. Nate Pennington is here, helps out. Thank you, good afternoon, everyone. I'll be brief. Uh, as y'all are aware, the National Alliance to End Homelessness was engaged by the City of Asheville in partnership with Buncombe County um, with funding support from the Dogwood Health Trust and to identify needs and develop a report containing recommendations to guide homelessness work within the county. Uh, the request itself is to establish one new regular full-time position, the program manager is the exact title, as part of the coordinated response to homelessness. And this was identified in the report itself. This is the county's portion of that, of that effort. And this position would be located in the planning department's community development uh, division. And I am here for any additional questions that you may have on this item in particular. I'm excited to uh, have the opportunity for us this to be in front of us. I, I wondered if um, y'all could, at the staff level, could share any thoughts on how being situated within planning will, will, or how this position will interact with and intersect with, say, behavioral health or some of the other related issues. Um, and, and if that's something that's maybe in development, it's also uh, fine to come back later with that, but would just love to hear any early thinking on that. Sure. I'd be happy to provide you with a couple of key points. Uh, community development does sort of serve as the central point for housing needs in the county. Uh, community development coordinates regularly with other departments, including health and human services, on related items, programming, and projects. And community development meets regularly with the city's community development uh, services department, staff to coordinate activities and programs, and this collaborative would be further strengthened by this position housed in this uh, uh, community development division. I can go on with numerous other points, but I thought I'd just provide you with a couple of key highlights. Anything else? I'll make a motion to approve the new full-time position. Second. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thanks, Nate. All right, next up is consideration of the McCormick Field Renovation Project funding and Tim Love is here to get this conversation started. Good evening, commissioners. I'm here this evening to talk about uh, McCormick Field, 
got a few slides that we'll run through today, uh, but also wanted to recognize in the audience today, we have Brian DeWine with us. Uh, y'all know Brian, but uh, Brian's available. If there's any specific questions that y'all want to touch on about lease points or things like that, Brian gets to answer the tough ones. So uh, in terms of background and request, um, y'all have heard this before, but for the benefit of the public, uh, the city of Asheville is pursuing the renovation and, and, and enhancement of McCormick Field, which is a city uh, owned property. Uh, the primary reason for this is to meet uh, Major League Baseball mandates, uh, but also to provide additional community benefits. The uh, City of Asheville has reached out to uh, a number of entities, including the Asheville Tourist, the TDA, and Buncombe County Government, uh, to provide additional support to, to bring this to reality. Uh, the Commission has reviewed this item on, on multiple occasions. Uh, first instance was at the budget retreat in December of 2022. Um, additionally, we brought this before you on March 7th at the briefing. Uh, since then, uh, City of Asheville City Council has taken this item up and uh, approved on March 14th uh, a financial plan to move forward uh, for April 1st. Uh, that approval was to meet uh, Major League Baseball requirements, and uh, we've got a financial plan that we can share with you today to give you a sense of what that looked like. Our ask of the board today is really of guidance. Um, you know, Buncombe County staff have presented uh, information to you, but we would like your feedback today in terms of your willingness to financially partner with the city of Asheville on this project. And if willing to financially partner, would like a sense of uh, what level is that financially? So a two-part question. Um, as a refresher, uh, the financial plan, this is a, a screenshot from a recent uh, city of Asheville presentation. Uh, the last time we met, uh, last two weeks ago at the briefing, uh, there were two options that were on the table. There was sort of the, the minimum requirements and then there was the full project. Uh, the leanings as we understand them at this point are towards the full project, uh, which is the slide that you see in front of you. And so that's a project of about $37.5 million, but when you factor in interest uh, from the debt, uh, a project closer to $56 million. Um, in this model, uh, we see the city of Asheville contributing right under a million dollars for 20 years. Uh, you see the club or the Asheville Tourist, the team, uh, averaging uh, about 468 over that same 20 year period. Um, in our last discussions, we talked about how that those payments would be structured and it is a fixed uh, determined structure. So the tourists have a specific payment that they make on an annual basis for those 20 years. Uh, you can see the county here at $5 million uh, over the 20-year period, so that's about 250 k per year. Um, additionally, you can see the contributions of the TDA uh, at about $1.4 million over a 15-year period, uh, putting them at about $21 million, or 41% of the project. Um, those are the, the current scenarios that we've discussed. Um, would like your feedback, obviously, today on uh, the county's contribution, if any, to this project. A uh, final note before I open it up for y'all's discussion, I just wanted to revisit some of the frequent questions that uh, we walked through last time. Uh, some of these are, are pretty standard, but I'll state them again uh, for the benefit of the public. Uh, so what are the assurances that the team will stay? This is probably the number one question that we get. Um, so the, the tourist, the team, uh, intends to sign a lease uh, of a minimum of 20 years. Um, I think they have a willingness to go further than that. They haven't signed the lease today, but uh, that, um, in essence, keeps the team uh, required to make a lease payment that averages $468,000 over the 20-year period. Um, additionally, the Houston Astros, which are you know the, the major league team, uh, they uh, will be here through 2030 based on the agreement that Major League Baseball has with all minor league teams, not just ours. Uh, the current franchise agreement extends through 2030. And so we would expect uh, that to continue for all major league or all minor league baseball teams, including ours. After 2030, candidly, um, we'll see where that goes. Um, next question we always get is, you know, sale and relocation of the team. So how do we prevent the sale and relocation of the team, in particular after investing uh, public funds into a project like this? Um, so first off, uh, this is straight from Major League Baseball. Any, any sale of the team must be approved by Major League Baseball. This isn't a unilateral decision uh, that the Asheville Tourists can make, the minor league team. Uh, they would need to seek some approval from Major, major League Baseball. Uh, those decisions Major League Baseball has shared with us are really based on facility standards, first and foremost, but also 
markets. Uh, Major League Baseball has an interest in being in certain markets, and we believe that ours is of interest to them, as it always has been. Uh, final note on this, Major League Baseball recommends some type of no re relocation clause um, installed into the lease, and so that's something I think we should pursue uh, with our partners. Uh, details of the lease, I'm not going to get into the nitty-gritty. If you have questions, I'm definitely going to rely on Brian. Uh, but the lease amount, it's a fixed payment schedule that averages that 468k per year. Um, the leasee, um, this was a question last time we spoke. Uh, there are two entities uh, that are proposed here. Uh, the first, the leasee, is DeWine Silver Dollar Baseball LLC. And then the grantor is uh, DeWine Enterprises Incorporated. And I can't speak uh, to the, the history of either of these organizations, but if you'd like to hear from Brian today, I'm glad to bring him up here. Um, a few other key points that I'd like to hit on. Um, the lease, as currently uh, devised, has guaranteed or defined capital improvements to be made by the city and the team on a regular schedule. Um, the last I checked, those are at year seven and year 14 to make sure that we're maintaining uh, the facility over time and preventing um, extensive de deferred maintenance. Um, additionally, the team gets naming rights um, for the facility, but there's also a defined public use schedule. So how will the facility be used by the public? Uh, there's some structure built in to make sure that there's a certain number of days, a certain number of events, uh, things of that nature um, that the team will be responsible for. Uh, final note here, public, public purpose, how might this facility be used beyond baseball, beyond the 68 games that are played a year? Uh, some potential examples, um, concerts is one that comes up frequently, um, the, the, an idea of a winter wonderland um, in the colder months, ice skating, um, additional baseball clinics, high school games, things of that nature. Um, I can also note that uh, this was a question that was posed by city council to staff, city staff, and so they've spent time working with the neighborhoods around the baseball stadium to understand the types of events um, the types of uh, issues that they were facing um, to, to work with them moving forward. So those are just a few of the, the questions that we've heard. Um, my final slide uh, is about next steps um, and then the request of you. So the milestones for the city of Asheville, council voted on March 14th. Uh, a financial plan is due to Major League Baseball by April 1st. Uh, from there, um, if things are moving along based on county commission support, uh, next step would be presentations to the TDA uh, through their product development life cycle. Anticipate that would happen in late April um, with reviews happening in May and June and ultimately a decision uh, sometime after then. The request again of the board, it's twofold. Uh, would you like to, like to know from you, um, are you interested in supporting this project financially? And if so, at what level? And so that's my presentation. If you have any questions, glad to take them. Also glad to bring someone from the audience up if necessary. Tim, would you mind to highlight slide 11, please? It's the financial responsibility matrix. Glad to do it. I, you, you did a great job of highlighting a lot of the frequently asked questions. I think the one that I hear outside of those most often is, Major League Baseball and the Esters have a lot of money. What are they kicking in? Why aren't they doing anything? And I, I just want to laser focus in on this um, matrix a little bit because I think it answers what Major League Baseball and specifically the Houston Astros do kick in for, for the tourists, which of course are the payroll and the benefits for players, coaches, and the support staff within the team, the team travel, as well as equipment, and all the lodging food, nutrition, and medical care. And as we know, lodging in this community is, is expensive. And they pay for that 100%. And then you can see what the Major League Baseball does cover as well. But that does seem to be the second question that I get asked the most often. Absolutely. I'm not sure I have much to add to that. Um, but this matrix does exist to give a sense mm -hmm. of who pays what. And uh, you're exactly right. Uh, the Astros, the big club, if you will, uh, you know, they basically pay the labor, lodging for the, the team, the players, um, as well as coaches, umps, things of that nature. Uh, the tourists uh, basically maintain the operations. So, the you know, the, when you show up at a game and you see people that are, you know, running concessions or, you know, doing, you know, games and, you know, reaching out to the crowd, you know, that's the team. Um, baseball, uh, Major League Baseball rather, uh, those are your league administrators, your umpire salaries, your national marketing. 
And then finally, but not least, you know, the, the city of Asheville has a, a responsibility here for facility maintenance and on a hundred plus year old stadium uh, that is an ongoing need and, and certainly not to be understated. Yeah, my question I have, <clears throat> I know the state has been act, asked to kick in up front and say if the state comes through with $5 million, which the revenue bond is for 20 years at fixed rate, but that will lower what will be borrowed, right? Absolutely, and this is a discussion we've had um, with our partners and the city of Asheville who will ultimately have the debt. You know, this is their project. Right. And so all of our discussions have centered on how do you reduce the long-term cost of this debt? Uh, one way that you do that is by paying down the principal, similar to what you would do with a mortgage, so that you ultimately minimize your interest long-term. Um, I, I think that's something that the city is certainly open to and something that we've uh, been encouraging. Um, one other note on, on the state side, you know, we're, we're hopeful that we'll see some support um, in, this, in this budget cycle from the state. Um, that is something that has not been determined at this point, but we have seen positive uh, items in the governor's proposed budget, <clears throat> so we'll, we'll see where that lands. What I'm getting at, you know, if that money comes in up front, can we take that off what we pledge? because everybody else will be lowering it, right? We won't have to pay as much on an annual basis. I, I think that's certainly a valid question, and if that's the, the direction the commission would like to take, uh, certainly, certainly a direction this could go. Other questions or comments? So one of the questions I had, Tim, <clears throat> it's kind of in the similar kind of what if this happens. Um, so there are these cost estimates for the project, right? There is a fair amount of contingency built into those cost estimates. So, uh, which is, you know, responsible thing to do because, uh, you know, sometimes you, you find things come in higher than you would want them to or think they're likely to. So kind of like... Um, Commissioner Whiteside's question, I mean, kind of on the upside scenarios, right? Like, what if um, what if um, there's not a lot of contingency needed, right? Like, there's sort of the cost estimates for the project, and then there's contingency, things that might cost more than expected. Well, what if what if they don't? So is there, because, I mean, I'm, I'm supportive of the project. I want the county to be a partner. I don't think it's fair to the city taxpayers that they would have to right. carry this all on their shoulders. It's used by people throughout the county and throughout the region. So I think I think the county should be there. But I also want the folks working on this project to figure out how to, I mean, mostly what I hear people say is like, I love going to the games, I love it, it's great, please keep it. I don't hear people say, I need like a completely fancy new stadium. Like, like I think they mostly want to kind of keep what we have, what people have loved for years. So I want to structure this in a way that like, um, so that once we vote on it, people don't feel like, Go spend it. You've got you've got this money. Just spend it. You know, I would like for them to look for ways to not need to spend that contingency money, and I'd like you know to like advocate for this. We're advocating for the state to come in here. So, I want this project to be successful, but I also want it to be done in a way that's as financially responsible to the city and county taxpayers as possible too. So, uh, are there any thoughts on how we could? say, here's what we want to do, but, you know, don't spend that contingency funding if it's not truly needed. If, you know, if, if there are things that come in on budget, that does still happen sometimes, then, um, you know, the taxpayers wouldn't have to contribute as, as much. So, any thoughts on that? Sure. Uh, I think, you know, first off, this evening, you know, we're asking for guidance from the board. Um, you know, are you interested in proceeding? If so, at what level? I think fair to say that at a future date, you know, we would need to bring back before you uh, something more binding in the form of a resolution, for instance, uh, that would state kind of what your criteria are as a board, what, what makes you comfortable here. Um, I, I think there could be items such as uh, Commissioner Whiteside's mentioned. I think possibly uh, having additional, uh, I don't wanna call it oversight, but involvement on, on, on the project team to understand kind of what the expenses are. Um, I think those are items that could be considered if those were agreeable. So I definitely think there's ways to achieve that um, okay, great. And one thing with that, Tim, I mean, when we 
make a motion we could say up to two hundred and fifty thousand right if that's what the board agrees on and then that way if if the state comes in with funding or there's not the need for all of it then it's not committing us to 250 it's up to 250. Okay. Yep. Um, another item we could certainly frame in the resolution absolutely. Tim could oh. Brian do you want to comment on come on. yeah yeah come on up come to Mike thanks for being here. Brian DeWine with the Astral Taurus. I appreciate everyone having me today. I just want to kind of loop you guys in on the state funding. It is something we are working on. Um, the city is actually counting on it. And if the, if the state funding does not come in, then they're going to do a facility tax on tickets for the ballpark. So as a backup plan to cover that gap funding, if the state funding does not come in, there's going to be some kind of facility tax that will kind of help with the gap. So that's where we are as far as you know, state funding coming or not coming is that there's a backup plan of a facility tax. Well, you mean that's in what they are going to give? The mm -hmm. They are counting on the state funding in their projection? They've got kind of a flow chart where it's, all right, this, if we get $5 million from the state, then we're going to have to pay this. If we get $4 million, we're going to have to pay this, and so and so. And if we get nothing from the state, then we're going to have a gap. And at that point, then we're going to have to put a facility tax in. How much will the gap be if we get nothing from the if state? If you get nothing, the, the gap will be about 100 to 125,000 a year if we don't get anything from the state. You're using the word tax, you mean a, a fee sorry, on ticket sales? Sorry, not a tax, sorry, I shouldn't okay. say tax. I can't impose okay. a tax, a facility fee. Okay. Yes. Sorry for that, that was my slang, so. <laughs> would that be on ticket sales? Yes, that would be on tickets. It would equal about 75 cents per ticket. Um, a, a, Full season have a little bit less since you didn't have a massive fee on it. Okay. I just I, I just want to make sure I'm tracking on the state piece. So the maximum that we would expect from the state would be up to five million. If, is that correct? So the the state piece, candidly, not ironed out. We're envisioning it would be a grant program okay. uh, where the the max would. Uh, be approximately five million dollars per facility. We'll have to see what what that would actually shake out to be. Um, what we do know is there's a fixed number of facilities, and so all of these facilities are dealing with similar issues, mm -hmm. and so we expect that pot would be kind of evenly shared among them. So. And in the slide three, the full project financials as envisioned currently, where is that state funding currently reflected in that slide? Sure, uh, and it is not actually demonstrated in, in this particular slide. Um, the That gotcha. financial plan is not based on including state funding. Okay. It's here's how we get it done without it. Okay. So, yeah, w where is that gap mm. coming from? So what I think Br Brian is referring to is what I would define as kind of the, the backup plan. So if, you know, we've got our, our core plan, which is here's how you would get there. Um, but I think the city, rightfully, and other entities are thinking about how do we reduce that amount. Um, step one is securing state funding. Um, if that doesn't happen, what are some other options? Um, and I think one example would, would be the, this ticket option um, that I'm less versed in and, and will not speak to at this point. So. The city's conceptually said they're willing to invest up to a million a year? That's absolutely. Or 950. Nine, 950, that's 950. correct. Yeah. I apologize if I missed it. I, I was asking the county manager a question. What, what does that fee look like per ticket? Can you remind me what that was if you answered that? Um, it will be about 75%, 75, excuse me, 75%, <laughs> about 75 cents per ticket. Um, it will not be percent, it will be a flat rate. Um, we've been playing with the numbers. Again, you know, honestly, it's a, something we don't really want to do because, you know, we're $10 tickets. And so that's a high, actually, tax. And so it's not something we really want to do, but it is a backup plan in case the state money does not come in. And that would not be, like, some ongoing year-by-year -year increase to make, make up for that? No, it would be, again, about $0.75 cents a year. We'd figure it out on the front end, so. Okay. But it would be, but it would be if there were... How long does the model show you'd have to keep the 75 cent fee in place in order to make up for the state funding that didn't show up? Uh, the life of the 
Love life it. of the lease. Okay. And so it would that need would to be it, for twenty years. Yes, correct. It would need to increase, but it would need to be there over the life. It would need to be there forever if the state did not come through. Got it. All right. Other questions, comments? If not, I would like to move that we approve entering a partnership with the city of Asheville for McCormick Renovations up to $250,000 a year for 20 years. Second. All right, we have a motion and second to approve up to $250,000 uh, <clears throat> over 20 years, so maximum investment of up to $5 million over the 20 year period. Further discussion? And this doesn't bind us to any specific course of action at this point. This is just to re kind of come back with some specifics that incorporate what we've been discussing to date. So we're giving direction to staff. This is not a definitive agreement. Uh, the final approval of this would be uh, reviewed again by the county commission as part of the definitive agreement. Is that, do I have that correct? I wanna make sure, good question. Like from a process standpoint, this is, is this the vote or is this the vote in preparation for a formal vote? But giving the direction we think we're going to go down. That's correct. So voting in favor of support uh, with a resolution to follow at a later date that would be more definitive. <clears throat> this is giving in direction. <laughs> we could bring that resolution back after we meet with the city so that they can have their plan for the Brian and the DeWines by April 1st. Okay. All right. So I'm... <clears throat> So I'm not I'm not gonna um, I'm not gonna request a, uh, an, a, a, an amendment to the motion, but I would just kind of want to make a comment that you know uh, I'll support it, but my support for the definitive agreement uh, will be contingent upon um, that, and I'd like to ask our staff you know and our other partners to you know to spend a little bit more time looking at this because I, I do want to make sure that if we're going to make this long-term financial commitment, 250000 a year for 20 years in the city, and we're all city taxpayers, or not all of us, but like many, you know, our, many of our constituents are city taxpayers and some of us are too, are, are committing, you know, to a million dollars, maybe close to a million dollars a year for all these years. Then, um, and of course the tourists are stepping up too. That's been a nominal lease payment in the past, but now it's going to be much more substantive. But I think it is very important that we have uh, that our that the taxpayers can feel confident that the tourists, as a business organization, will um, will fulfill their obligations under the lease over the full life of that lease. And so, uh, so that the taxpayers can feel confident, I would want to see that there is um, a creditworthy guarantor that is a party to the agreement. Uh, I understand the. Organizations mentioned, but we need to fully understand, um, you know, how credit worthy that organization is, or some other credit assurance or some type of credit vehicle, so that um, if we make the commitment long term as a community and taxpayers, that we're confident that both ends of the um, the arrangement will be upheld by all parties. So I want to I want to kind of get into the details of that a little bit more when it comes back to us. Other Can questions? Ask one are, question yes, sir. From the tourist. Now, is this a payment of 458000 a year for 20 years? That, that's the average payment. Um, it's a Wait, whoa, 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 average. That's okay. correct. What is the payment then? Yep, and if we could pull up the slides one more time, communications folks. And so in this slide, you can see, if you look all to the far right, um, sort of our second row, the club, uh, you can see it's an average of four. 15 years. So the first five years, uh, there's an average of five years of 450K and then an additional 15 years at about 475K. And that's how it evens out. And that, that's a specific schedule. Yep. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Nay. Okay. All right. Uh, well, thanks to everyone for getting it to this point, and appreciate all the members of the community who have been weighing in on this, uh, this topic for the last uh, many months. So thanks all for being engaged. Appreciate it. All right. Um, the next item on the agenda 
is a budget amendment for community development block grant, neighborhood revitalization, uh, grant funding award, and John Hudson, our budget director, is here to present this item. Good evening. This budget amendment is to accept the award of a community development block grant for neighborhood revitalization in the amount of $400,000 to fund home repairs for low and moderate income homeowners. This funding begins April 1st and it can be used until September 30th, 2025. And can you tell us a little bit, this, this is great, can you tell us more about this for those who may be in need of this funding, how? have assistance. Great. <laughs> Good evening. Nancy Williams with Community Development. I came in August and September with the public hearing and the agreement for this application. The $400,000 will go to um, our local nonprofit partners to assist homeowners, single family homeowners, with repairs. And the hope with this program is we can do more substantial repairs, up to $30,000 with this funding, and the hopes of doing 12 to 24 projects over the two years. Any other questions? Thank, thank you. Well, I will make a motion to approve the budget amendment. Second. Thank you. Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. All right, and we deferred the TDA item. All right, we come to board appointments, commissioners. The first is the Home and Community Care Block Grant Advisory Committee. We have two reappointments and one appointment. I'd like to reappoint Rebecca Hertz and Eileen McMinn and appoint Cindy Threkeld to the Home and Community Care Block Grant Advisory Committee. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Next is the Juvenile Crime Prevention Council. There's seven reappointments potential, but we have two applicants tonight. We are understaffed there, so I will motion that we reappoint, reappoint Angie Garner and appoint Dr. Armstrong. All in favor say aye. 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 You second right, okay. <laughs> Any opposed? Okay, sorry, jumped the gun there. Um, Mountain Community Capital Fund Operating Committee. Um, so we've got Tim Love and Rachel Nygaard serving. Um, so commissioners, we do have a policy that says we appoint uh, boards and commission members for two, uh, two terms. But um, the staff have asked whether we can consider this differently. I do think it's different. I mean, I think when we appoint uh, this, we're, we're normally thinking of like citizen or resident boards and commission members. This is different in that we basically have staff helping us in terms of our representatives on this board. So I don't think the same criteria would as apply as like a citizen volunteer type of role. So are y'all all comfortable with that? Agree with that. Okay. Yeah. And I'll emphasize that neither one of these, uh, we only have two reappointments. So this isn't like we're ousting or keeping anyone else from getting their name in the ring. I mean, we, if we didn't reappoint them, we would have to find two other people to do it, which could be other staff, or it could be citizens. It could be it could be any of those things. Well, I'm just saying, no, no one else applied for these two. I imagine, right? Is that correct? It, there was oh, no okay. There was no application process for this. Oh, we were, haven't advertised for it, it. Correct. There were reappointments. Oh, okay. So I, I do agree with what you previously stated, though, with this board. Right, we need staff on this board. So I. I'm good with, I'll make a motion to, do we need to waive the term limit in the motion or just? I don't think you need to. I think we've had a conversation yeah. about it. I would say in the future, you know, we do have uh, staff who serve on other boards and commissions, like, mm -hmm. um, I can't remember who's on it right now, but like in the past, like MSD right. had the staff and maybe they still do in other boards. So I would say if there's staff that are serving in a role you know, I would take it through the regular process. I mean, in this case, it does just, it feels right to me that like staff should just do this job. But in other mm -hmm. cases, you know, it might be that we want to do a resident or we might do a staff. So we, we, we would want to, I think we'd want to kind of kind of take it through the regular process, even though like in this case, you know, we're just going to keep the staff doing it or asking the staff to keep doing it. So 
Chairman Newman, this, yes, sir. And, and, and this would kind of be the regular process. We would bring it to you guys, and you would let us know if you wanted to advertise for this position. Yeah. With the um, recommendation of the reappointments is typically how we would do that. That was good. I will make a motion to reappoint Tim Love and Rachel Nygaard. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, and last... Um, congratulations, Tim. <laughs> Thank you for your service. Um, and last up is the Mountain Area Workforce Development Board. It's one reappointment. Move that we reappoint Eric Watts. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, great. We have a couple of announcements to make. On April 4th at 3 p.m., the county commissioners will hold their briefing meeting at 200 College Street, room 326 in downtown Asheville. And then on April 4th at 5 p.m., the county commissioners will hold their regular meeting at 200 College Street, room 326 in downtown Asheville. We do have a need for a closed session. Mr. Euler, will you explain the purpose? Commissioner, before you go to closed session, I do want to remind you that there is a budget meeting coming up that the full board would be a public meeting. And it is um, next Tuesday, November, March, March 28th at 1130. March 28th at 1130? I thought it was 11 a.m. 11 to 2. 11 a.m. Yes. And it'll be here in the county commission chambers at 200 College Street in downtown Asheville. <laughs> okay. Thanks for the reminder. All in, oh, is there a motion to go into closed session? Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. When we uh, finish the closed session, we will not take any action. We'll just adjourn.